Hello and welcome back. What I'd like to do now is go through some tactics with you, Napoleonic tactics. But first let's look at the big picture. <clears throat> War in Europe. And the French are up against coalitions formed by the other countries around. Why? Because they'd overthrown their monarchy. If you can do it in one country, the monarchies and others thought they could be next. And so they decided to set things back to right. There were seven coalitions at all. Why, why would it take seven coalitions to defeat the French? Because a character named Napoleon Bonaparte kept mucking things up for them. He would uh, use the French army to get in between each of the individual uh, opponents before they could merge into one big opponent and defeat them individually, divide and conquer. And how did he do that? Well, the French army were very mobile. Army moves at the speed of its slowest unit and most of the other armies in Europe, the supply train was the slowest unit. The French lived off the land and um, as a result were able to move quite quickly. He split their, his armies up generally too to move along parallel roads so that they could live off the land and as they approached the enemy he would call them back together so the French army appeared as one army, generally somewhere where the opposition didn't expect them to be. So that's, that's one reason. But on the battlefield, why were the French better than uh, other forces? Well, except for the British, who were the best troops in Europe, and the reason for that is they were the only standing permanent army, so they learned to shoot better, to, um, to do their drills better. Uh, but they were small because of that, and as a result, in Spain where they fought and then in Europe, they always had to fight with allied forces. So the British were the best, done deal. But as for everyone else, the French, of course, um, were fighting for France and the Republic. And it's easier when your country's being invaded and uh, you're threatened to, uh, to get serious about it, whereas the attacking force, maybe not so much. The second thing was Napoleon, they, the soldiers loved Napoleon. He led them to victory after victory after victory for the glory of France and to put and restore, not restore, but bestow glory upon the individual soldiers and their units. The next uh, part is quite interesting. The French, the French were one of the, I think, the only army in Europe where you could actually get promoted up through the ranks on your ability. Uh, in all the other armies, um, the British, for instance, the officer corps generally bought their promotions or their ranks. Uh, the other armies, the aristocracy, bestow upon them their rank. doesn't necessarily mean they're going to make good, good generals and um, soldiers. If you've got uh, a body always coming up through the ranks of men with ability, you would expect that army to be uh, quite a solid force, and that was the French. And um, because of attrition fighting every other uh, country in Europe, uh, they did have um, this, this continual upward movement of soldiers through the ranks. Now, towards the end, of course, uh, the conscripts coming in didn't have a lot of time to train, etc. And that, uh, that meant that uh, they used a tactic that we'll talk about in a little while. So, I'm going to do th uh, three videos. One, Napoleonic tactics for infantry, cavalry, and artillery and they're going to be looked at through my favorite set of rules tricolor and uh, let's face it whatever set of rules you look at the tactics must be very similar otherwise you're not dealing with historical statistics and facts you're actually writing a book of fiction so uh, we'll look at um, infantry and how they um, were used on the battlefield we'll look at the column charge and square and then we'll move, then we'll stop this video and go on to cavalry. Towards the end, though, I will do a small combined arms, which I need to do to show you what cavalry can do to infantry and why they then needed to use square. Alrighty, so let's get going with this. Here we have a battalion of Nassau's on the left in the green, a battalion of French line infantry on the right. These two battalions are virtually equal in number and in fighting capacity. So, I just want to show you what happens um, 
if they stand at long range and fire at each other. So the first shot is fired. Imagine, if you will, uh, smoke everywhere. And I'll take out the casualties. Okay, they reload, they fire a second shot, out come some more casualties. They reload, fire a third shot, some more casualties are taken out, and they're being taken out basically at the same rate because these troops are fairly equal in uh, ability. And a fourth shot takes out some more. Now the what happens now is that uh, they've reached a number where their morale is becoming well, it's shaky. And uh, I've tested the morale, and both of them uh, break. So they've had enough. They both retire from the field. They they're not going to take any more. What's actually happened here? Um, four shots and both units are retreating so if the french were holding the trying to hold the nassau's in place uh, in fact uh, they've achieved uh, that and the nassau's are retreating but they in return are treating so this has just been a, a battle of attrition which really has not achieved uh, anything for either side in this scenario, the French have marched on in column, same as they did last time, formed into line to uh, fire and drive the Nassau's off. And what happens? The first shot is fired. Imagine all the smoke, etc. And out come the casualties. Now this time, the French reload but they actually advance forward to close the distance for firing. The second shot is fired, and as you'd expect, it's going to be a little bit more devastating because uh, they're getting closer, and their accuracy is increasing just that little bit more. Okay, so that's, that's been pretty severe, as you can see. They reload, advance closer again, third shot. And what's happened here is they've both been reduced to the point where again their morale breaks and they retreat. So by closing the gap to fire, this time they've only lasted three volleys. And that gives you some idea of um, what will happen on a battlefield when two similar regiments attack each other. Uh, the chances are that they're both going to be put out of action. If, and, and that's just the way it works. This time, the French march up in column, as they normally would. And then that's the end of that move. On the next move, what they do is they throw out their skirmishers and using an attack, they move straight in to the Nassau's. Now, what you've got to imagine here with these lights is that they're, uh, they're all spread out along here. And the idea is to keep the Nassau's focused on them and not turning to shoot at the column as it advances. Okay. Firing takes place and the casualties are the lights are all killed plus four in the column. In return, the French kill four Nassau's and four where they've met here. What I'll 
I'll do is I'll switch this around so that I can take four out of there and four from there. The melee takes place and it's uh, an overwhelming effect as you can imagine. There's um, a small screen of uh, Nassau's being hit by all these French troops in column and they're immediately pushed back. And that would be the end of that move. Now on the next move, these infantry here move into Mali with the French. And uh, I've already done the, the maths on this. And it's uh, a success for the French. which means these forces have to be pushed back. Alrighty, so end of that move. Now, in the, the next move, the uh, Nassau have to um, retreat. The French sort themselves out and advance as far as they can in half a move. There's no firing because um, there's just no firing because they're uh, all in the movement phase. The Nassau now are attempting to sort themselves out. The French come forward and strike them again. And this time, because they're in disorder, it uh, is an automatic, uh, well not an automatic retreat, but it's in disorder, so they're at half points. If they beat them before in four points, they're certainly going to uh, r crush through them in half points. The Nassau's again pull back, as they must, and some casualties come out. And a couple for the French. And then the French, because they've still got some movement left, move forward and any unit in disorder hit by troops in formation is automatically destroyed. So the Nassau's split and uh, race off. They're not all dead, of course, but the units disband and men are running everywhere, seeking shelter, just running basically, uh, which means that unit is out of action for at least the rest of this battle, and so we will call it destroyed. So, what's happened here? Using a different tactic to trying to shoot their way through, the French have used a column charge, of which they were uh, quite um, famous for doing. The reason you use a column charge is the troops coming in, uh, to, especially towards the end of the Napoleonic Wars, didn't have the training that they should have. Uh, they didn't have time to. And so they found this tactic of column charging to be relatively effective. It won't always work. That column uh, could attack could have failed in the first move. It was um, pretty much an even thing, but um, they succeeded. And in um, so doing, they put a um, Nassau battalion out of the battle. And imagine, if you will, this is an unbroken line of infantry running across the battlefield. The French have now pushed through. They're behind the front line, and that's going to cause a problem for the Allied commanders with the French now splitting that gap. And through that gap, if you were lucky enough to have cavalry to back it up, the cavalry race through, and then they're in behind your entire front line. And... Um, you're in a war-winning situation with that. These troops, these French troops, have taken a lot of casualties and their morale is close to needing to be checked, but uh, not so far. And um, that's a column charge. Uh, it can sometimes succeed. If you used a better quality troop like Grenadiers, you would almost always succeed in breaking through a line regiment even taking the casualties uh, that the French have taken. So that's the column charge. In this scenario, before I show you uh, infantry in square, I just want to actually impress upon you 
the danger of cavalry and Y squares were used. Now in this scenario, you've got the French have advanced in uh, column. They've gone into line at long distance to hold the Nassau battalion. On the flank have turned up French uh, hussars. Now, there's 16 of them, which is not a large number in the scheme of things. But if the Nassau's do nothing about them and stand in line, those hussars will attack and hit the French in the flank. And the result of that melee is that five times out of six they will succeed in absolutely destroying that battalion for a very small loss to themselves. And what's happened here, of course, is the French have held that Nassau battalion in place to allow the cavalry to get on the flank. In this scenario, the Nassau's have uh, refused the flank. And what that means is a company at the very end has turned to face the, the incoming hussars. They let go a volley and it actually succeeds in taking out two hussars. The rest charge in, but this time they're hitting this group, this uh, uh, platoon, this uh, yeah platoon that has turned, and uh, I've worked it worked out the uh, the sequence. They ride straight over the top of them. I think there's another one of those taken out. They're destroyed completely, and then they ride into the flank of what's left. Now, in this scenario, the number left is, is less, and working out uh, being hit in the flank by charging as ours, even though there's three less of the 16, this battalion now is completely destroyed again. Uh, there's, it's not even five out of six times. It's a genuine cannot win that melee and so the cavalry uh, have ridden down that Nassau battalion even though uh, they've lost uh, some men on the way in. In this scenario the Nassau's have refused the flank but turned two platoons around and when this happens, look at the number left facing an entire French battalion. What would be the best tactic here is the cavalry don't attack. They hold those Nassau's in that position, always threatening to attack if they try to reform back into line. And the French battalion here, using its entire fire, very quickly subdue basically half this Nassau battalion. As soon as the firing reduces the Nassau numbers to a point where their morale breaks and they retreat, they will take those two groups with them and in so doing allow the cavalry then to charge in and cut them to shreds while they're retreating. Again, any unit in retreat hit by a form unit is automatically destroyed. So in this scenario, the cavalry don't attack, but are used to hold the Nassau's in place, while the French battalion, although it will suffer some casualties, outshoots what's left of well, half a battalion of Nassau. And once they break and run, taking those guys with them, uh, the cavalry will finish the job. In this scenario, we'll just uh, imagine at the moment that the French battalion isn't there 
and this Nassau battalion uh, has seen the cavalry coming and they formed into square. So the cavalry attacked the square and the troops standing in the inside of the square fire at the uh, Hazars. Now this is a full body of Hazars, not 16, it's the, it's the full regiment of Hazars and they take out some casualties. Now, the rest of these uh, Hazars attack the square, and I've done the calculations. Five times out of six, that square will not break. So you could virtually guarantee the square will survive, and that the attack by the Hazars will fail, and they'll be forced to um, retreat back to reform. And if they attack again, They'll lose more to the uh, volley fire from the inside of the square, which makes it a very unpalatable thing to do. Now, these Hazars, uh, of course, are light troops. Their value is in reconnaissance. They're not heavy shock troops, but um, they failed to break the square. Now, the next scenario, I'll show you what happens when lancers attack a square. In this scenario, the French have sent in their Polish lancers. Now again, as they charge in, the square fire and take out some casualties. Same as they did for the Hazars. But lancers, by their nature of course, have a lance which can outreach the muskets with the bayonet on held out to form like a porcupine effect that the square has. That gives the lancers a huge advantage when attacking a square. And in this scenario, the number of lancers left will break that square five times out of six. So that's the difference between the two types of cavalry units. And once that square is broken, the men have nowhere to go. They're totally destroyed, taken off the field. And the Lancers lost some troops, but um, they, they wiped out a whole Nassau battalion. Okay, so what's the tactic here? If these Nassaus got caught out by themselves, anybody a troop with cavalry around, has to form square. It's their best chance. Against lances, it's um, not so good, but who's got lances on call at any given time? Now, the other tactic is uh, here you can see if you've got a French battalion coming up, use your cavalry to force the enemy into square and then column charge with your uh, own infantry and smash into one side of that square and you'll split the whole thing wide open and then the cavalry can charge in and clean it up. Or use your cavalry to form, force the enemy into square, come up, form into line and fire into the square, which can only fire back one side at you, so a quarter effectively. And even then, because the front line is kneeling, it'll only be the back line. So it's an eighth of the men in the square are firing back at your whole battalion. It'll only take probably two volleys to reduce that square to a morale problem where it breaks and runs and the cavalry goes in and uh, cleans it up again. So always use infantry to support cavalry actions or vice versa, always have cavalry supporting your infantry as they come forward. And that is one of the basic lessons of infantry and Napoleonics. Now, on the next section, I'm going to move on to cavalry and we'll have a look at what cavalry um, can do. This is a perfect example with squares, but we'll just exam examine the different types of cavalry.